We'll have a series of 20-minute uh, presentations that are species-specific to transportation um, in this next segment. Um, I would like to ask everybody and remind everybody that we do have a parking lot uh, whiteboard out in the reception area for those colleagues that are in the room today. This is a space where you can ask um, your questions anonymously. And um, what we would also like to see on this um, board is some take home messages or themes that have come from this meeting um, over the next day, um, the, ne the rest of today and tomorrow that the um, committee, the ILAR uh, committee can take forward to build their next steps on what we've um, discussed and learned today. So please do take advantage of the whiteboard out in the reception area to um, leave your thoughts and your questions um, for us to, to work from later on and going forward. Um, with, for, with no further ado, I'm going to um, invite Dr. Joe Simmons to the podium to talk to us about um, non-human primates and their species-specific particularities. So uh, thank you, Judy, and, and I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to talk, especially Dr. Bill White. Uh, when Bill asked me to give this talk, he gave me a little bit of advice, and what he wanted me to do was touch a little bit on the planning and logistics of um, transporting non-human primates, and then to kind of take you on a journey of what a primate would, how a primate would travel from a, a foreign country to the U.S. So I'm not going to go into great details on the regulations, but I'm going to touch on the agencies, really, that, that um, that contact or have, have a stake in transportation of non-human primates. So, so this is about everything that you need to know about transporting non-human primates. It's planning, 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 and more planning. And the reason that it takes so much planning is that there's so much at stake. Um, you know, we've heard a lot of questions here today. Uh, there's clearly a public interest in the transportation of non-human primates. Um, there's a lot of regulatory oversight of the transportation of non-human primates. Um, but more importantly, uh, a research primate probably costs anywhere from $3,000 to $10,000 an animal. And so when you, when you get a shipment of, of 1,000 of those animals, it, there's millions of dollars at stake. And so it's something that has to be done safely, not only for the welfare and the well-being of the animal, but the, the companies that are transporting the animals have a huge vested interest in doing it safely. So. <clears throat> NHP transportation is really a trying exercise in, in planning and logistics. Um, every detail has to be thoroughly thought out and it has to be very well planned. And you have to plan for the things that you've experienced in the past and you have to plan for those things that might happen, that have never occurred before. So there, there's a lot of um, gaming that goes into it for you know trying to figure out what could go wrong. Um, and again, Part of that is permitting, and we'll talk a little bit about the permitting here in a few mi minutes. Um, you have to have ground transportation on both ends. So usually from a, a, a farm of origin to the airport, uh, you have to have air transportation then from that foreign country to the U.S. And then you have to have ground transportation again from the airport uh, back to a, a registered quarantine facility. Um, and one of the most important things that you have to think through is what's the weather like? Uh, because they may ship from a country where it's 80 degrees. Uh, they may stop, um, you know, do a refueling stop where it's below zero. And depending on the time of the year and um, whether they're going into the northern tier or the southern tier of the U.S., it could be extremely hot or extremely cold. So you have to plan for that all along the route, and you have to make decisions. Do we ship or do we not ship? So who's involved? We heard a little bit about CITES earlier. Uh, CITES is the Convention on the International uh, Trade of Endangered Species of Flora and Fauna. Um, and it's a multinational uh, treaty or agreement that most countries of the world, or many countries of the world, are signatories to. Um, and the CITES uh, authority here in the US is US Fish and Wildlife uh, Service. Um, but there's also the foreign equivalent. And for an animal that's coming into the US, the, the more difficult permit is actually the CITES export permit from the country of origin, okay? Um, coming into the U.S., uh, you can essentially get a blanket uh, permit to import. Uh, the USDA and its foreign equivalent. 
uh, they have a stake in the transportation of, of non-human primates. A custom service from both the uh, exporting country and the importing country. CDC, and very often its foreign equivalent, uh, has a stake in transportation. We don't often think about it. I heard it earlier, Homeland Security and TSA. They're one of the first people to greet a plane when it comes into the U.S., so they, they want to take a look at it. Um, and then possibly state veterinarians, uh, depending on where the animals are going to. So you have to look at state-specific uh, requirements as well, and on and on and on. So there's a lot of planning, a lot of people have a stake um, in transportation of monkeys. <clears throat> so from the pre-export side, um, there's permitting. Uh, in the U.S., it often takes uh, three to four months to get a CITES export permit, to export uh, a CITES listed animal from the U.S. to a foreign country. And that's not only the animal, that's anything associated with the animal. That's a cell line that's been in cell culture for 50 years. If it was taken from a CITES animal, you have to get a CITES permit. That can take three to four months uh, for you to get. From countries of origin, it, it can take weeks, but often it takes months. So that planning has to be considered. We've heard that we have a, a CDC mandated uh, quarantine process here in, the U, here in the U.S. That's three negative uh, tuberculin skin tests at two-week intervals. So it's a minimum of 31 days if everything goes perfectly. But very often countries of origin have a pre-export quarantine process. And that process can be from four to six weeks long. So you're talking about animals that are being transported and are in a quarantine process for anywhere from you know, nine, nine to 12 weeks. Uh, if there's a positive TB test or suspect TB test, it could actually be quite a bit longer. And then arranging transportation. Again, all of the parts of the transportation are very difficult. So ground transportation in the country of origin, air transport to the U.S., ground transportation again um, in the U.S. Uh, to a CDC uh, um, inspected and approved quarantine facility. So what are some of the other logistical concerns that we have to think about? Well, again, we talked about it a little bit, and that's weather. You know, weather being primarily temperature. And again, like I said, it could vary greatly along a transportation route. Um, and so you, you have to take that into to consideration when you're, you're figuring out your route planning and contingency <coughs> planning. You have to have contingency plans for all phases of transportation. Um, and again, we talked about that uh, earlier when I answered the question about veterinary care. But it's not only veterinary care. Um, you know, you have to have contingency plans for weather, contingency plans for mechanical breakdowns, et cetera. And that's not only during the, the ground transportation, but the air transportation as well. So, you know, what would you do if a plane uh, uh, has, has a mechanical problem when it stops for gas in Anchorage, Alaska, and the temperature is, is below zero? I mean, you have to plan for that. You have to, because those animals are effectively in quarantine from the time that the door shuts in the country of origin until CDC releases them here in the U.S. So those animals, while they're in transport, are still under CDC quarantine. And again, uh, when you start thinking about um, animals arriving here, uh, especially large shipments of animals, uh, you know, if it's 100 degrees on the tarmac, we talk a lot about the animals. Um, but the reality is that it's the humans that are going to be wearing the Tyvek suits. So you have to think about as much about your personnel or more about your personnel than you do the animals. Because uh, the animals, there are very strict regulations about how long that they can be out and how long that they can be exposed and um, when you need to, to get them in. But there aren't those same regulations for the people that are wearing the Tyvek suits. So you have to give that a consideration as well. Emergency planning. Again, mechanical breakdowns are a huge issue, or potentially a huge issue that, that you have to think about a lot. Uh, you know, Bob Fernandez uh, gave a great talk on uh, ground transportation, and one of the things that um, we're very lucky is that uh, the ground transporters that I've worked with are a very collegial, collaborative group, and they help each other out an awful lot. Um, so if there, if there is a breakdown, another, another um, uh, ground carrier will step up. If they have the closest truck, the closest equipment, uh, they'll come in and help out. And so I, I think that that's, that's a great thing. But what about planes? Uh, planes break too. Um, so you have to give some thought around 
what, how you're going to handle that and whether it's going to be at a, a station where there's places to care for the animals or, or there might not be. We touched on veterinary care a little bit earlier. Um, and again, air charters frequently include a veterinarian um, along with the shipment uh, to take care of the animals to make sure uh, that they're well cared for in their trip to the U.S. Um, and the land-based transportation um, is often done by experienced uh, animal care technicians, people with experience working with non-human primates. Um, also, veterinarians uh, during the, um, the ground uh, transit portion are, are always available by phone. And in some cases, there are veterinarians that work for or own uh, ground transportation businesses. And so they trans you, know, you have veterinarians uh, transporting the animals themselves. So in essence, all of those things have to be thought through and you have to have a plan. So if A happens, how do we react to it? If, if one of these uh, issues comes up. So now what I want to do is kind of take you on a transportation route of a monkey from a foreign country um, to the US. And I'm going to do it in pictures. And this is an, an example, you know, there was a question earlier about where monkeys come from. Um, and most pharmaceutical companies require that um, animals be captive bred. Uh, many pharmaceutical companies require uh, F2 generation or later. Uh, so these animals, in some cases, uh, in, in breeding farms uh, in foreign countries, are F6, F7 generation. Um, so they've been in captivity for, for quite a while. And they're raised in places much like this. Again, very complex social environments, uh, group housed animals, uh, lots of color, lots of structure. Also, one of the things, one of the key features, I think, of a, of a high quality uh, producer uh, or vendor of, of non-human primates is that they have human interaction plan, uh, programs. And in this case, uh, this particular supplier um, is interacting with the animals so that the, essentially humans are seen more as a treat fairy uh, than as something to be afraid of. So that there's a lot less stress when they interact with people, there's a lot less stress um, when they're being transported, et cetera. So this is a farm where, where monkeys would come from. The next thing we need is a crate. And we heard a lot about IATA standards this morning. Um, and I guess I'm guilty of using an old standard. Um, but when I looked through my computer, uh, the 2012 uh, book was all I had. So uh, this is a crate. There are about three or four different designs of crates um, in, the IATA, in the IATA regulations. Um, and again, these, these are a suggestion. So um, again, the key features are things like a slide out tray for droppings. Uh, you want to have uh, food and water bowls. Um, in some cases, you want wire mesh uh, on the outside to keep animals from chewing out, uh, double layers of screening, uh, recommendations on uh, all sorts of uh, things related to the crate. But the one thing you need to remember is that if it, meet, it can meet the IATA standards but not meet USDA or Fish and Wildlife standards. So you, it's one thing to, to look at IATA, but you also need to look at the US government regulations. And if there's an issue with the crate, they don't hold the shipper responsible, they hold the receiver responsible. So you're responsible for auditing crates um, if you're receiving animals and ensuring that they meet US standards. Okay, and here are a couple of examples of crates. <clears throat> These crates meet both IATA standards, but they also meet uh, both Fish and Wildlife and USDA. And again, two different sizes. This would be a size for maybe a two to four kilogram Cynomologus macaque. This is a bigger crate for, for like a 10 kilogram animal. And again, has to be bigger, heavier, stronger wood. Um, some monkeys think they're beavers. Uh, they can chew through wood very, very well. So crates have to be very carefully constructed uh, to make sure that the animals can't get out. So preparation for shipping. One of the things that's important to note about uh, the CITES documentation is, it, is, is that it actually specifies the animal numbers that can be shipped, the individual IDs of the animals that can be shipped. If the animal's ID is not on the CITES permit, it should not, be per, uh, should not be transported, okay? So a lot of detail goes into 
double checking, triple checking, et cetera, what animals are in, in the consignment. When the crates are crated up and the animals are in the crates, very often they're given a, um, a valued food source. So understand that biscuits are uh, great high density food, but uh, you need water if you're gonna eat biscuits. Sometimes water splashes around, so very often fruits and vegetables will be provided because, again, uh, it's a favored food item for the animals. Then we have preparation for shipping from a farm in China. So very often uh, the doors are screwed shut. Everyone knows that, so most transporters, et cetera, have, have uh, screw guns. And then they're transported in some sort of transportation to a local airport. And these are non-human primates at a major airport in China. Um, this is the animal holding facility. Uh, so we saw some other examples of, of animal holding facilities earlier. One of the things that you can see is there's an air conditioner. So this is an HVAC controlled room. Uh, you can see from the crates, uh, these doors are all open so the animals are being fed and watered. And of course, uh, they have that uh, droppings tray, and so usually the last thing that happens before uh, the animal is, is uh, packed up for the international shipment is that th those are changed out. It's also important to note that uh, many of the Chinese farms actually, they will fly the animals in cargo, and they will fly a veterinarian um, on the plane with them, you know, in the passenger uh, compartment, um, to take care of the animals until they're shipped. And I've actually had animals pulled out at this stage and sent back to the farm. So if the veterinarian says, animal isn't looking so good, I don't think it's gonna make the trip, they'll pull them out and send them back, back to the farm of origin. So it's, it's a very good plan to have veterinary care at every stage. And this is uh, a truck that's used um, to transport animals on the tarmac of the same airport. Um, again, it's HVAC controlled, you can see the air conditioner here. Um, and we heard, you know, again, it can be very warm on tarmacs. Uh, they can be in there for longer periods of time. So it's very good to have HVAC controlled uh, trucks and facilities to care for them. This is sort of building the pallet. So we talked about these, these cookie sheets. Um, that's sort of the standard pallet in the air industry. So these are a group of crates that have been palletized. And then, of course, they throw uh, cargo netting over it to make sure that the load doesn't shift. And this is actually a rival here in the US. So the interesting thing to note here is that these guys, these aren't people that work for the transporter, these are people that work for the airline. So these guys all have to be trained um, in the risks of working with non-human primates and in how to properly wear their uh, personal protective equipment. That's the responsibility of the receiver. That job is often done by the transporter. So the ground transporter will go in in advance. They will uh, train the airport personnel um, in the risk of working with monkeys and in uh, how to keep themselves safe uh, when they're doing so. And you can see, again, it's 90, 95 degrees this day. They're all wearing their Tyvek suits, appropriate PPE. And again, arrival, arrival on the tarmac. Again, airport personnel. And then they, they make it over to an area where uh, experienced non-human primate technicians uh, can then take control of the animals and start uh, assuring that the animals are being cared for. I don't know if you can see it, but these animals are very curious. So they're already, they're not hiding or cowering in a corner. Uh, they're up, up and looking around, seeing what's going on. So lots of inspections, you know, uh, look in every single crate at every single eyeball, make sure every animal is doing well. Uh, same thing here. We have to remember that this entire shipment is under CDC quarantine. So everything that touches uh, the animals or comes in contact there has to be disinfected. So you'll see these sorts of bottles and here, here this is a, a pallet, a, a cookie sheet that has been, um, that the pallet or that the crates have been removed from. Hello? Um, that the crates have been removed from, and of course they're spraying a disinfectant on it. Ah. And of course there are the government inspections. So there was a USDA inspector here this day. 
Uh, there are two uh, fish and wildlife inspectors that took a flashlight and looked at every single monkey, so 1,000 to 1,500 monkeys, looking at every single eyeball, making sure that every animal is okay, uh, and they were. And we had an inspector from CDC as well to make sure that the quarantine uh, shipment was handled appropriately. And again, um, and when you start looking at uh, the government regulations, so uh, Fish and Wildlife, for example, it's an engineering standard, not a performance standard. So you can't say that it was a su successful shipment, all the animals uh, did well, um, and so it's okay. Um, so since it's an engineering standard, they will get out a ruler and they will measure. They will make sure that your gaps are correct and, and that all of that is, is done appropriately. Um, and this was from a Fish and Wildlife Inspection. Interestingly, what they complained about was this plastic sheathing um, that you know, prevents uh, water and urine from leaking out of these crates. So they complained about that. That's there because of a CDC requirement. And so when I tried to explain that to the <coughs> Fish and Wildlife Inspector, he said, well, that's not my problem. So one of the things that we run into in, in shipping non-human primates is there are various government agencies and sometimes they're, um, sometimes they aren't completely aligned. And it's incumbent on us to make sure, to walk that fine line, to tiptoe through that minefield, to make sure that we meet everybody's regulations and do it safely. And of course, there's planning. So this was a ground shipment. Uh, this animal, this isn't quite as spectacular as the one that Bill showed earlier with, I'm not sure what that was, that ate out of the entire crate. But here was a, a monkey that was trying to chew out. Never made it out, um, but I have seen issues where, experience times where monkeys have chewed out of crates. And now you have a monkey that's loose in a cargo, you know, in a cargo hold of a ground transporter. Well, what are the, what are the plans for that? Well, in general, you have to have two doors between the monkey and the outside world. Um, you have to have people who are experienced at, at catching the animal. Um, they have to have the appropriate equipment to do that, so nets and gloves and things like that. They have to have them with them when this occurs. Um, and they have to know how to go in and do it. So that's why we use experienced uh, animal care technicians in the shipment of, of non-human primates. Um, but also, you know, many shippers have a, have a camera. So they'll have a camera in their cargo hold so that they can monitor the load as, it goes, as they go down the road to make sure that there haven't been any escapes. So very important. And that's just one of an infinite number of issues that could occur uh, during, a, during an animal shipment. So what's the take home message? Well, international non-human primate transportation is really a, an exercise in planning logistics and meeting uh, the reg regulatory and public expectations for a safe transport of animals. There are really only a small number of people and companies out there uh, that regularly transport non-human primates. Um, and it really should be left to those sorts of people and companies to do it because, again, there's a lot of logistical planning that has to go into uh, doing this well. And in, and in fact, I, th I think that in general, um, the transporters are really meeting that. So I, I reached out to Bob Mullen from CDC and asked him for um, statistics <coughs> on the most recent year that he had available. So he sent me statistics for uh, fiscal year 2012, so from October 1 to September 30, 2013, almost 20,000 non-human primates were transported. Uh, there were only two recorded uh, deaths during that transport. So if you calculate that out, that's one in 10,000 error rate, or 0.01%. So it's not perfect. Um, and I think that we would like for it to be perfect. Um, but it's getting pretty close. I mean, I, I think that, that, that a lot of care and thought goes into transportation of of monkeys these days. And that's it. So thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, next up to the podium is um, Mr. Andy Smith from Marshall Bioresources, and he'll be speaking on dogs and ferret transport. Thanks, Judy, and thanks to the organizers of the conference and to Bill White for the invitation to speak today. 
Uh, just briefly, uh, I'm with Marshall Bioresources. We're a purpose-bred uh, supplier of beagles, mongrels, ferrets, and Gottingen mini pigs. We raise animals in the United States, in the UK, and in China. Uh, we have global sales and transportation networks. Uh, I mention that now just to um, provide you with a little bit of background that I'm speaking to you from the perspective of an animal breeder. So shipping dogs and ferrets. Um, it should be easy, right? Um, everyone has seen dogs going down the road riding shotgun in a car or a pickup truck. You open the window a little bit, give them a little fresh air, they're happy. Uh, we've all seen uh, animals, uh, dogs especially, in the passenger compartment of airlines. If it fits under the uh, seat in front of you, I guess it's okay for takeoff. This one here, I don't know if we'd recommend that one, but um, I don't know what the outcome was of that shipment, but uh, we probably don't want to know. So uh, easy, right? Well, not really. And based on what others have spoken on earlier today and maybe what subsequent speakers will comment on later, I think you're going to start to hear some common themes in that uh, the process may seem simple and straightforward, but in reality, it isn't. So a brief outline, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to focus mainly on dogs. Uh, I'll have a couple of comments about ferrets, but dogs will be the focus of my talk. We've talked a lot about, uh, or heard a lot about rather, um, transportation standards and, and regulations, and although they can be uh, somewhat onerous at times and difficult to understand and deal with, I think it's important to remember that they're there for a reason um, and that uh, the goal is to always look out for the health, well-being, and safety of the animals that are being transported. I'll also comment a little on IATA and USDA regulations, uh, as has been done uh, by others. Documentation uh, with respect to dogs differs a little bit, uh, whether it's an export shipment or a domestic shipment within the United States. I'll have some comments about air versus ground uh, from my perspective as well. As uh, the previous speaker just uh, mentioned, crates are important. Uh, no, no difference there with dogs. Maybe there is a little difference with dogs in that they are companion animals and, and um, there's a lot of pet dogs in the United States in particular. And when we talk about shipping dogs, it is different. Um, a dog is not a dog. A little bit about what can go wrong, uh, some of the pitfalls that can uh, come if, if we're not careful. Uh, and then finishing up with some comments about airline issues and I will talk a little bit about animal rights impact. So USDA regulations, as they apply to uh, dogs, they apply to air and ground ship, uh, shipments domestically. Carriers and intermediate handlers cannot receive animals more than six hours prior to departure, as you've heard this morning already. Uh, must have name, address, phone for consignee. Sign off by shippers. I'll breeze through these not to bore you. Uh, the 45, 85 degree temperature range applies to dogs and ferrets as well. Uh, there is the provision for an acclimation statement, um, particularly with, with ferrets as a, a fur-bearing animal. They're fairly well suited to the cold, and if it's below 45 degrees and they're conditioned to it or exposed to it for short periods of time, they don't mind. So it's up to the discretion of the veterinarian, and if they're uh, comfortable issuing an acclimation statement, uh, that does allow deviation from the standard USDA uh, temperature minimums. USDA says containers have to be strong enough to contain the dog securely and to withstand the normal rigors of transportation. It's kind of a blanket statement, um, but I guess that sums it up. Animals can be quickly removed in the event of an emergency. Um, with dogs, we don't use screws and screw guns as was described uh, with regard to primates, um, but it's, it's an apples to oranges uh, comparison. Numerous specific requirements relating to ventilation, no sharp edges, sanitation, et cetera, et cetera. These are all uh, very well published if you're interested in some of the details. Again, along the lines of, of general terminology, um, when we're thinking about dogs and the size crate that they're shipped in, dogs must be able to turn about normally while standing, to stand and sit erect and to lie in a natural position. Uh, that's subject to interpretation or uh, the subjectivity of the observer. Therefore, it's uh, incumbent upon the shipper 
to make an assessment and judge what is a large enough crate for a dog. <laughs> Uh, food offered every 24 hours, water every 12, similar to other species that you've already heard about. The four hour observation and ground transport is applicable here as well. Um, generally, the same regulations apply to ferrets. And just to reiterate, the focus is on providing a safe journey for both species. Briefly with IATA, um, there's a broader list of species-specific container requirements. We had the trivia question earlier today about 7,000 plus species. Um, and there are more extensive uh, illustrations uh, relating to container constructions. Uh, whoop, sorry, went for the pointer and got the advanced slide button. So um, these are just examples of dog crates that are suitable. Um, and also under IATA, we do have some comments about stocking density. Uh, this one in particular relates to ferrets and the number of animals that can be put in a certain size container according to the size of the animal. In terms of documentation that has to accompany these shipments, uh, domestically uh, it's, it's a simpler process. We need an animal health certificate, uh, an airway bill, uh, that's applicable to air shipments, obviously. Uh, a bill of lading is a somewhat analogous document required for ground shipments. And then there's a USDA transfer form, uh, which records the disposition of the animals from the registered breeding facility uh, to the research facility that is the recipient of the animals. Exports, as you might imagine, become a little bit more complicated. Um, Export air shipments involve the airway bill, a shipper certification, an invoice, a route plan, an import permit according to circumstances, not always needed but uh, frequently. Rabies vaccination certificates, uh, the health certificate does have to be issued by a veterinarian accredited with the USDA and endorsed as well by the USDA. And there are various country specific requirements that are almost too numerous to list. Uh, there's a section there on Canada as well. Um, we might think of that as closer to a domestic shipment because it's typically done uh, via ground in the case of dogs. But whenever you have a border crossing, it, it can complicate matters. So uh, generally, uh, air versus ground, what are the pros and cons? Um, when you think about time in transit, obviously airlines um, are the preferred way to go there. I think we all have a common goal of uh, keeping animals in transit for as short a period of time as possible uh, to reduce the stress on the animals and reduce the likelihood of anything uh, going wrong. Uh, airlines are faster than ground transport. Environmental control, uh, I'd give the nod to ground transport. Uh, as we saw in, in uh, Bob Fernandez's presentation this morning, uh, you can do a really good job of controlling the environmental conditions in a truck because whether it be a, a breeder who does their own shipping or a carrier who is specialized in animal transport, uh, these are people that know what they're doing. Uh, they know about um, proper environmental controls, not just in terms of uh, temperature and humidity and ventilation, but some of the biosecurity uh, factors that uh, were discussed earlier as well. Similar with uh, animal observation, it's it's fairly easy to equip trucks with camera systems, uh, temperature recording, uh, other monitoring devices so that the driver as he's going down the road has a real time um, indication of what's happening in the animal cargo area. When it comes to cost, um, if you're shipping large quantities uh, or small quantities, um, typically it's going to be more expensive to ship them uh, by ground. Your options to ship large quantities by air are quite limited, and I'll talk more about that as I go. Um, but even in the case of large, or excuse me, small numbers of dogs shipped, for example, from New York to California, it's a whole lot more cost effective to do that with an airplane than to send a truck for two or three dogs. Capacity is better with ground. Uh, again, I'll talk more about the restrictions that come with airlines uh, in some subsequent slides. Public exposure risk, 
if you're shipping by ground, again, with a breeder or with a specialized animal transport company, they know how to manage those risks. The animals can be kept under direct control for the entire journey. Um, you don't have risks associated with tendering animals to uh, airline staff, uh, both at the airport of origin and the airport of destination, or other folks that may be in a position to access either information about the shipments or the shipments themselves uh, along the way. Uh, possible schedule disruption. Again, with ground, you can control it. Um, that may mean proactively deciding to reschedule a shipment because of the nor'easter that's coming. Um, or it may be just a, a function of your journey planning and uh, knowing where your truck is going to be at any given time along the, along the way. And you just don't have that level of control with the airlines because you're subject to decision making um, from outside your organization. Uh, larger animals, uh, in this case dogs, ground transportation is typically the way to go if it's available to you. And with ferrets, uh, it's the reverse. Ferrets are a smaller animal shipped in a smaller crate. It's more practical to ship them on airlines and it's more cost effective to do so. So shipping crates on the right is obviously a dog crate. On the left is an example of a ferret shipping crate. and. I'll highlight here that not all shipping crates are created equal and we have evaluated many different styles and brands of crates over the years and in almost 100% of the cases I can tell you that a cheaper crate is not a better crate and most of those that you would see in a pet store or a big box retailer they may be perfectly fine for uh, housing your pet at home crate training your dog for example but if you subject those sorts of crates to the Samsonite test that was referred to earlier, you may end up disappointed with the results. I mentioned that shipping uh, dogs intended for biomedical research is different than shipping pets. Um, even in terms of perception or image, um, you can see the dog on the right. Um, it's someone's pet in an airport. Uh, it's, a, it's a happy looking dog. It's ready to come out with his leash and rejoin the owner to go walk down the beach somewhere. The photo on the left shows properly packed and secured beagles intended for a research shipment. But you can see what I'm saying in that there's a, there's a different uh, image that's portrayed um, by these two pictures. So we need to be aware of that. Um, both from my perspective as a shipper and also from the perspective of those of you who might receive animals. Because large numbers of dogs working their way through airline facilities do attract attention and sometimes that attention may be of the unwanted variety. So uh, the last few years have brought about the proliferation of uh, cell phones and cell phones with camera devices in them. Maybe you can't even buy a phone without a camera these days. Uh, the risk of observation of these uh, research animals in airline facilities is made all the more concerning because it doesn't take long to snap a quick photo and uh, maybe it takes even less time for people to post it to some of these social media sites that uh, are commonplace. So what can go wrong? Um, I guess I'm in a long line of speakers today who has an example of a crate that looks like uh, it didn't hold up well. You know, if you're shipping dogs, this isn't what you want to see. Um, the risk of uh, an escapee is there and it presents a problem potentially not only for the dog itself, which is obviously of concern, um, but None of us want to be in the headlines in the newspapers for uh, dogs escaping planes and running across runways. Sometimes just little things like the bottom left photo um, where we're missing one of the bolts that is required to fasten the crates together. Um, something like that may give a dog something that it can work at and eventually, um, uh, you know, the possibility is there that the dog could escape. We want to do everything we can to prevent that, primarily for the safety and well-being of the dog. I'll reiterate comments from the previous speakers that uh, along the lines of planning, 
Not only do you want to have your plan well laid out, you want to communicate it very effectively to the drivers of your trucks because they're the ones that are fully responsible for those animals once they leave uh, a breeder's facility or an academic institution uh, for transfer. You really need to rely on those folks to know what to do, not only when things go right, but when they go wrong. And along the same lines as uh, you know, what I mentioned earlier with the proliferation of cell phones, that's a good thing in that it facilitates communication between trucks and uh, headquarters, office locations, where people can assist the drivers in deciding what to do uh, if, if there are situations that they are uncomfortable in. So airline issues. Um, the little chart here, <laughs> in a simple way, illustrates what others have said in that the number of airlines, uh, in this case, that will accept research dogs has declined steadily and significantly over time. The trend seems to be <coughs> continuing. And folks have commented today about the cost-benefit analysis, and that's entirely true. That's a, a very valid point. But there are other reasons. Um, we've had situations where the pilot would refuse to accept a shipment of dogs because it's their personal opinion that uh, dogs shouldn't be used in biomedical research and the, the, the captain runs the ship, as they say, and, and so he'll say, no, we're not going to take that shipment. Um, sometimes it may be due, due to noise or odor complaints. There are uh, various things that can cause an airline to reject a shipment. Here again, um, a dog is not a dog. There are literally dozens of airlines that on a global basis that refuse to transport research dogs but will gladly accept the pet dog of a paying customer. So it's not that they have issue with dogs. It's an issue with um, the research nature of the animals and their intended use. I'm going to finish up here just, just by commenting a little bit on the animal rights uh, aspect. And uh, perhaps it's appropriate, given the two gentlemen that started off our program this morning by voicing their opinions. There are groups out there that have identified the key link uh, between companies like mine, which is an animal breeder, and companies like some of yours that conduct the life-saving research uh, that benefits us all, and that is uh, the airlines. And they've refocused some of their energies that in the past may have been dedicated toward uh, physically breaking into facilities or protests and, and really targeted airlines. And frankly, they've had some success with pressuring airlines to discontinue uh, shipments of research animals, not just dogs. And the point I would make here is that this tactic on the part of these groups does influence the cost-benefit decision that the bean counters are making that we heard about earlier today. We have examples where airlines that have been gladly accepting shipment of research dogs for decades will be targeted by the large animal rights groups and the CEOs of these companies will literally receive tens of thousands of form letters by email in a 24-hour period. And on that basis, they will make a, a, a binding decision to discontinue shipment of research animals. They're worried about their image. It's a PR thing, but it's also a, a situation where they don't want passengers to uh, have any reason to choose another airline. So. Those of us who, who work in this field um, know how well our animals are cared for, uh, both at the breeder facilities and at the research facilities. And we know that the folks that disagree with the use of animals in biomedical research, you know, they have noble intentions. They do what they think is right for animals. But in the case here, um, what is actually achieved by pressuring airlines to discontinue this transport is that in some cases, the transport for the animals will be that much longer because they can't go in a plane, they'll have to go in a truck. I don't think that helps the animals because they're subjected to the stressors of transport for longer periods of time. In some cases, um, it may get to the point, and it already is, where animals cannot be moved to all the destinations where they are needed 
Therefore, the research may well move to where the animals originate. And in some cases, that may not be the United States, that may not be Europe, that may be in Asia. So again, um, the folks that, uh, that, that protest on behalf of the animals, um, I believe they have noble intentions, but I believe there are some unintended consequences on their part as well. Finishing up with take home messages, um, many complex regulations, um, but we're all concerned about the safety and well being of animals. Take care with your documentation and crate selection. Either of those things can cause you problems that you don't want to have. Understand the risks and, appara and prepare accordingly. It, it's not, uh, you know, like the dog riding shotgun with his nose out the window. Um, there's more to it than that. And there are many potential pitfalls. So if you need to ship animals, uh, work with someone who knows what they're doing, um, or before you undertake it yourself, make sure you don't underestimate the challenge and uh, do your due diligence. And uh, again, recognize uh, the overall threat to biomedical research that's posed by some of these groups um, and their influence on airlines. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Um, we have our next presenter, Dr. Bill White, will um, present on mice, rats, and other small animals. Thanks. I'll grab my lightsaber here. Okay, so everybody's fastened their seat belts low and tight across their waist. We are about to <laughs> ship rodents and rabbits. So, bunch of terms that have been going around and I thought I'd just take a moment to make sure we're all on the same page. A consignor equals a shipper equals the institution shipping the animals. So if you hear that term, that's what that means. <coughs> Consignee is the institution receiving the animals and a carrier is the company transporting the animals. In the case of the, air, the airline is the primary car carrier. If a trucking company, they can be a secondary or intermediate carrier. So those are the terms hopefully you've gotten. Um, some important considerations, just in general with rodents and rabbits. First of all, make sure the animals are fit to travel. We heard about some things from Lynn regarding this, but there should be no physical or metabolic conditions that would preclude them from traveling. So they would, they would be unhealthy during that trip or, or would not survive it. And you need to identify any special requirements for travel. Again, Lynn mentioned those. You need to determine what guidance documents and regulatory requirements apply. In the case of uh, the LAR, container requirement 84 if you're going to use a filtered container, container requirement 81 if it's a non-filtered container. We talked about developing a written journey plan, use a species appropriate container, and if shipping in pairs or groups, uh, establish their compatibility before shipping. You don't want them having a fighting match in the container. So, shipping container construction. We're going to talk about that a bit. And the, the reason I'm going to spend some time on this is because I've seen folks ship rodents and rabbits in very inappropriate containers. And that doesn't help the animals. It doesn't help the carriers. It just is bad all around. So we're going to talk about what needs to be done. And we're going to cover most of these uh, topics as we move along here. So examples in container requirement 84, there's some pictures that show different types of containers. Commercially, we saw pictures of these as well. There are a variety of different types, whether they be plastic or out of uh, cardboard, et cetera. Uh, and there are some with overshippers. We'll talk about that for a moment. So an overshipper. Uh, is one or more primary containers within a secondary covering. So the secondary covering is this cardboard box, um, and then the primary container is a micro-isolator-like container that goes inside. Um, the overshipper adds structural strength to this whole shipping process and resistance to microbiological contamination as well as some moisture and thermal production. In terms of dimensions of the shipping container, uh, there is a performance standard in the law, and it is that the animals must be able to move about freely within the container so as to make normal postural adjustments and have adequate air space over their highest part of their body to allow air movement and to prevent injury from contact with the top of the container. 
So that overrides everything else. So if the container doesn't do that, then it's not an appropriate container. So the body of the container uh, can be cardboard with moisture resistant coating. It can be molded plastic. Uh, and there's a whole variety of types. Corrugated plastic, composite board, laminated plastic, it goes on and on. You can make it out of fiberglass or, or aluminum if you wish, but that generally isn't done. Performance standards. There is a performance standard in the uh, rodent container requirements. And that is that you do not have an appropriate container if you cannot stack at least eight fully loaded containers without damage or crushing of the bottom container. So if that happens and you, sh you need to examine that before you try to ship the animals, then uh, you're using an appropriate container. The interior surfaces need to be smooth and moisture resistant and durable. So, so in general, there is not an absolute requirement for a particular material or construction type, but there are some, if you would, caveats to this. So interior surfaces need to be covered by wire, solid, smooth plastic, plastic film, or other materials that resist gnawing by the animals. Uh, wire mesh has to be of a small grid size to prevent access to the container body and to prevent entrapment of appendages. And you need to use finished wire edges, so neither the animals nor personnel dealing with this container opening, closing, inspecting, etc., uh, are hurt. Just uh, to follow up on a point that was made, believe it or not, there are four different wire gauge standards across the globe, so 12 gauge wire in one place is not, not the same as another place. <coughs> The wire must also not allow the animals to gain purchase with their teeth. So a, an animal can begin to deconstruct a container uh, if there is a free wire edge, if there are unfastened wire seams, or if there are elevated seams or wrinkles in the wire. So you need to be aware of that. If the wire is not continuous but just covers the filter opening, then it must be fastened uh, into the container by use of uh, welding or other methods, so there's no access to the edges. Chemically welded wire onto the surface or cover free edges, those are ways to do it. Hamsters must have one and preferably two layers of wire. You can see a typical hamster container. Um, they need, really need two layers because they can actively disengage a container pretty easily. Um, a lot of interesting problems come. Uh, from hamsters being put in mouse containers by well-intending people who want to ship them by air and then they manage to ground a 747 for three days while we try to get them out of the wiring. Um, we use a non-reusable -re material such as cardboard. Is, uh, all critical junctions must be fastened with durable fasteners and that means staples of the appropriate gauge, strong non-toxic re water-resistant glue, or durable weather-resistant uh, Stitching, you don't want anything penetrating the bottom of the, uh, the container that can wick moisture out. And you can see examples of stapling, and this is chain stitching the top to make it easier to open the crate uh, upon receipt. <coughs> container lid must be secured in place using, again, permanent fasteners, the appropriate things to keep it closed. And if it's not lined with wire, wire mesh, it must be made of plastic or have a plastic film liner. Uh, transparent if the viewing window is placed in there. So there's often a, will be a sheet of mylar which the bite radius of rodents is such that they cannot get a purchase on a smooth surface. So that's the reason it manages to work pretty well. Again, we talked about viewing windows. Some of them are in, a con in the context of a cardboard or fiberboard container. You can see there's a little flap that you can open and a tamper evident uh, device that shows that it has been opened. In some of the plastic containers, they're actually built right into the uh, top of the container. The floor needs to be formed in such a manner that the junction of the floor to the walls does not form a channel for liquids. It must be constructed and coated in such a way that liquids cannot pass across the surface. Michaelman coating is a common um, uh, commercial coating that is water resistant. So you can think of it like a wax-like substance non-toxic and is often used in fiberboard. You can have a drop-in secondary floor where there's actually two floors to increase absorbency and many containers will have an option for absorbent pads to be put below the wire mesh. 
The whole point here is keeping the inside of the container dry for the animals by wicking away moisture. You can have divided shipping containers. Uh, generally, we don't see more than uh, two divisions, uh, three divisions in a container. Um, so this is a two and uh, the one division and two divisions. When you divide a container, you must divide it in such a way that you maintain cross ventilation in the container. So uh, many times, just trying to divide it in more than three divisions will just not work. Uh, you don't mix species and strains in the same container because they're going to be looking to get to the other side and to see who's there. Ventilation, the placement and type can vary. Uh, there needs to be the ventilation opens, openings on at least three of the walls of the container. Total ventilation space should be at least 14% of the total combined surface area of side walls. That number is 16% for USDA covered species. Most rodent containers, uh, I, I would like to say all, but most rodent containers actually exceed 16%. Okay. Com commercially available, not homemade. Um, additional replacement ventilation may be uh, provided on the top of the container. It can replace all or a portion of the ventilation surfaces on the sides. It must have filters completely covering the ventilation openings in the primary container if you're shipping SPF animals. Okay, and that's just some examples. Um, again, the, they need to be glued in place. You don't want the filters to be ripped off. If they're on the outside of the container, as in some types of plastic shipping containers. You want them to be protected from being ripped off or torn. Um, in some containers, instead of having an opening, a big opening, they'll have hundreds of smaller holes that are drilled into, for example, plastic containers to allow ventilation. Again, the same calculation for minimum ventilation size is required. Um, filters really need to be constructed of water resistant as well as tear resistant materials. Spun bond poly polyester filters are appropriate. They come in different porosity sizes, so it, you can get fil uh, filters that leave more or less air through. Um, again, we talked about that. Talked about spacer bars, um, either built into the container itself, or you can affix them to the outside of containers. The air channel should be about three quarters of an inch or greater on at least two sides to make sure that there's no way you can completely block ventilation when, when the containers are stacked. So let's talk about how air, how, how containers are ventilated. So animals uh, lose heat into their environment. That heat goes out as uh, conduction through surfaces, through radiation, heat radiating out through a heated surface. Uh, but the actual ventilation that occurs is based on convection. So the animals heat up the air, rises to the top of the container, and then moves out dragging in air of a lower temperature. The temperature with inside the container is called the effective ambient temperature. So it's the effective temperature that the animal inside the container experiences. The ambient temperature, which is the temperature outside of the container, it's what in wherever their enclosure is, is what actually is the, the engine, if you would, that generates ventilation. So if you lower the temperature, you're going to get more ventilation. <coughs> okay, That's how that all works. Let's talk about air filters. You put a new filter on. Spawn bond polyester filters are made very much like spiders will spin uh, silk for their webs. And so they'll lay it down in a random pattern back and forth. And the more uh, material that's laid down on a sheet, the smaller the average pore diameter is. So there needs to be a happy medium enough to, to catch particulates that would be inappropriate to go into the container, but not to obstruct ventilation. Once you reuse the filter and autoclave it, you bake on all the food dust and little bits of, of uh, bedding and you have a really efficient filter, but it doesn't move much air. So I would encourage people not to reuse containers by autoclaving them. 
there's a whole bunch of other reasons not to use them. Bob showed you about the plenum distribution, so I won't bore you with that. Okay, let's talk about a mouse size view here. Animals are in a process in which they are going to exp uh, experience some stress. But they are pretty adaptable, and unless you really challenge them with extremes in temperature, um, they're going to adapt to that pretty well. So let's talk about temperature. Now this is stating the incredibly obvious instead of the merely obvious. And that is, within a given container, given that the ambient temperature outside is this, five mice are going to generate more heat than ten mice, or, or less heat than ten mice. And so, again, keeping the, if the ambient temperature outside at an appropriate level to make sure that you have the appropriate effective ambient temperature inside is important. It's going to be a function of the number of animals in the container. This I borrowed from John Gordon. I would recommend his work to you. He's a rodent thermoregulatory physiologist, published quite a number of papers and uh, books. And this is the key here. There is a thermal neutral zone where animals seek to be. Um, they have a certain core temperature. And once you get above that, pretty quickly they're heat intolerant and will lead to very severe consequences. So heat is the real problem here. Cold, they have a lot of ability to manage cold stress. Okay, They have non-shivering thermogenesis. They have hair coats. If you, if you acclimate them, their hair coats will change in density. There's a lot of, a lot of basic biology that goes in back of it. So the key here is make sure they do not get in too high an elevated temperature. Now, they prefer temperatures, rodents prefer temperatures more in the 28 to 30 degree range. And that varies a little bit as to whether it's a single or a group of rodents. And again, a lot of work that one can look into. Each container must have affixed either live animals or laboratory animals. Um, and this is what those labels look like. And it basically tells you what to do. All right. There are specific sizes that are minimum dimensions. So you can't have some microscopic label pasted somewhere in the container. It has to be big enough so people can see what are the precautions that need to be taken. And I think there's one of the questions about placing the labels. Well, every once in a while, we'll get a container in where people obstruct a ventilation opening, and that's one of the reasons that it's best to have quite a few ventilation openings. And these labels can be printed on the appropriate contrasting background so that the direction up or the actual label itself can be put on. Um, we talked about species chewing it out. Um, basically, when rodents run out of food and water, they look for a light source and they chew their way out. And they are really motivated to do that, and they will do it. That's why you need to put adequate amounts of food and water in, and they will be, I, I believe, uh, willing to remain in their containers. Talked about not reusing shipping containers, get loss of structural integrity with disinfection. There's no assurance of disinfection. So you have this whiz-bang container, but it's in the dirty side of the cage wash just in case you want to ship something. Well, you just are asking for trouble. Um, and you may not be able to adequately reseal it. A lot of times we'll see people reuse one of uh, a commercial container and they, they don't have a stapling gun that's got 60 PSI in back of it so they put these little staples in and they'll just unfold during shipment. So again, problems that could be easily avoided. You're ultimately responsible for the escape of the animals. So if you ground a 747, someone's going to be coming looking for you for $75,000 a day. So it happens, and you, you need to be very careful. Um, talked, Kate talked about my, my microbiological status, complying with IATA. Uh, we talked about bedding being absorbing moisture. You need to appropriately disinfect it. So if you're s uh, shipping SPF animals, you probably don't want bedding that's right out of the bag that came from a mill that uh, uh, did not appropriately disinfect it. Bedding is a whole other issue. It's a real joy to go to a bedding manufacturer and see how these things were actually made. So it's a waste product. Keep that in mind. Uh, don't skimp on the amount. Okay, not a place to save. 
So you want to put proportionally increased amounts of bedding in on what you anticipate the journey is going to be. Given the distractions with travel, rodents don't often use enrichment items and in many cases don't use nesting materials very well. Um, shavings, wood product shavings, they will bur burrow into, mice will, um, but again, this is a stressful journey, but most journeys for rodents, when we look at transit time, are two days or less. And in fact, the majority are, are arrive at their destination within 24 hours. Food and water, I've seen everything put in for a food source. So little homemade sausages, this is polenta. This is from the UK. I just wanted to let you know that you guys get creative too and put on all sorts of corn and wheat and whatever in with a gel of sorts. And then there's the whole process of gelled water. So it's really best if you can for rodents to use pelleted or extruded dry rodent food. Keep it the same as in home colonies. Uh, it's, you also have commercially available pre-sterilized diet if you want to continue on with what you've, uh, your health moniker or health status. Uh, again, we talked about you can put it in to the bedding and rodents will like will forage uh, for the food. Um, if the extended length of uh, shipping is anticipated, it really requires substantial amounts of food and gelled water. And uh, care must be taken in their placement. You need to affix gelled water packets to the container. Otherwise, they can rattle around in the container and, you know, when they reach terminal velocity, something's going to get injured. So uh, an easy trick for that is to hot melt glue it to the inside of the container. And mentioned you do have to slit open the container for mice. Uh, rats will usually do that themselves, but we, we generally slit open the containers for all animals. This is what a water kit looks like. What it essentially is is a plastic container that can be affixed to the side of the wall, Ziploc pouch filled with water, and a drinking valve. Okay, um, gelled water again can be it's a, a either an auger or co uh, colloid stabilized water it can be with or without additional energy sources such as high fructose corn syrup. There are stabilizing agents to inhibit spoilage. It's generally uh, retort packed. So it's essentially sterile. Um, it is not a nutritionally complete diet. So you do have to put food in with it. Fruits and vegetables have moisture, but at a cost. Again, the same problem. It's a physical hazard to the animals since it cannot be affixed to the container. It dries out quickly when sliced and can't be really adequately disinfected. So I would discourage you from putting potatoes in. Um, again, you want to put in sufficient food to take into account delays. Uh, our general rule of thumb is we put in enough food and water to last for an additional 24 hours at a minimum over what our anticipated shipping time is. And there's no need to open the container during transit. If the delays exceed 24 hours, then it needs to be, if it's going to be opened for the purposes of either repacking or for adding additional food and water sources, it has to be done under appropriate, and the term they use is scientifically controlled conditions, someplace where you can do it aseptically. That does happen occasionally, uh, but generally that does not have to, have to be done. And it gets complicated to do that. Let's talk about shipping density. So. These are uh, guidelines that will be going in and force in the 2015 uh, IATA uh, recommendations. And the, the recommendations take into account elevated temperatures, temperatures above 24 degrees centigrade. And so it is, they're designed to space out the animals so that you do not have the level of heat accumulation. So these are recommendations for mice. This is part of the table for rats. Here they give the height as well as the floor space in square centimeters, square inches. And then all the other delightful little rodents. There's a similar one for rabbits. I just didn't bother to stick that on here. Shipping documents. I don't think I have to go through this. I mean, there's, there's lots of documents that go along with this. Again, always check the rules. Uh, it's a highly regulated system. It requires that you follow the system 
Okay, you, you need to do the, the things that are required. There are when it goes internationally, as we've speak, uh, spoken about, even with mice and rats, there are just a lot of documents that need to be compiled. There was an estimate that given certain types of cargo, there could be as many as 39 documents that are attached that have to go one way or the other. Uh, I, when uh, the gentleman who was speaking on, from the uh, Department of Agriculture is going to talk about the um, OIE, there are some efforts being made to make these simpler and electronically, and I'm sure he's going to cover that. So I'm not going to. Um, veterinary certificate, better known as a health certificate or <coughs> certificate of veterinary inspection, it's usually required for rodent shipments uh, when they're traveling internationally. Uh, and it may require an official export country certificate to be filled out and signed by the government. Keep in mind that uh, accredited veterinarians are acting on behalf of the USDA, but the really only official signature on health certificates is that of the USDA. So they must review and make sure that things are done properly in order to put their signature on a health certificate. Um, again, some, some countries require their own health certificates, specific types of wording. There can be certificates of origin and journey declarations. There, uh, some require some testing. Uh, it just goes on and on. So you need to be aware of that. It's often best to have the intended recipient to help you with this, as well as talking to the consulates for particular governments. But I wouldn't absolutely depend upon them having all of the information. Uh, it's best to have you, the consignee internationally make the arrangements, if not personally get involved in picking up the animals. Um, there might be quarantine imposed, and again, it depends upon the country. Um, and some have special forms, licenses, and, and certificates of housing arrangements for genetically modified animals. So it really depends a lot on the country. You need to get the background. Um, let's talk just a moment about mouse passport. Uh, it's a product of the National Center for Replacement, Refinement, and Reduction of Animals in Research. You can get it here. It's not a legal document, okay? I like to think of it as a detailed packing list with assembly instructions and an operating manual, all right? And it gives details on genetically engineered uh, animals that are being shipped that are needed to establish a new colony that are often not found in papers describing the model. So how do you actually work with these animals and appropriately care for them? Uh, it, uh, again, there's just a lot of reasons why, th why this is smart. Uh, the current document needs to be expanded a bit to assure that all necessary details are captured, but it's a good start. Um, and they, it needs to back away from subjective evaluations. But anyway, uh, and here's all the sort, just some of the sorts of information that is provided on that document or that form. Again, I would encourage you to use that as a, if nothing else, to benefit the animals being shipped. So that's the end. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bill. I was just taking some notes there. <laughs> um, our next speaker this afternoon is uh, David Lanes from the University of Oregon. He's going to talk to us a little bit about the transportation of fish. Thanks for the invitation to speak to the RLR uh, committee. Uh, my name is David Lanes. I'm from the Zebrafish International Resource Center at the University of Oregon. Uh, we're funded by the NIH, and uh, our mission is to distribute, uh, collect, and distribute the zebrafish model. So, 
So why fish? Um, there's uh, quite a few uh, uh, species out there other than zebrafish. We do have uh, transparent models in zebrafish, uh, useful for imaging transgenics. Um, they are available in Madaka as well. Both zebrafish and Madaka have uh, quite a few transgenics and uh, other mutant lines available. Stickleback is uh, gaining popularity in evolution and ecology. And uh, the goldfish is used in certain models. Uh, this is a transparent fish that I've bred. Um, and there's also a, a guppy here. So why fish? Um, we've got external transparent embryos, uh, fast uh, life cycle and development, uh, great genetics and transgenics available, uh, used in biomedical research and uh, evolutionary and ecology work. Uh, we can keep them at high densities and uh, lower cost. And uh, if we look here at uh, where the zebrafish is going, um, they are on line to have a mutated uh, or a mutant available in every protein coding um, gene in the genome. And uh, the Sanger Institute will hopefully have a completed phenome of all the, uh, the f mutant phenotypes uh, in the next uh, few years. <clears throat> so uh, if we look at the uh, number of uh, mutant lines and publications, they are going up uh, exponentially over time. And uh, while other models are seeing declines due to uh, funding issues, the zebrafish is still managing to go up. So in distribution, there's three stages we, we work with. Uh, first is the adults. Um, we can uh, mo move them around a little bit quicker, get the researchers uh, working on the, uh, the project. Uh, embryos uh, give us a um, more biosecure format, and uh, cryopreserved sperm <laughs> is the uh, the most dense uh, transportation we can do to uh, move lines around the planet. In adults, uh, we can move about 10 pairs of adults in a liter and a half of water. Uh, that's about 50 to 100 mils of water per fish. Unlike all the other models, we don't ventilate them. Um, we keep the oxygen in the box. Um, we can do up to 18 adult lines in a box at a time. Uh, those are usually uh, larger distributions to other resource centers. Um, the adults are up and breeding after a week or two and uh, working on the project. Um, they get faster results and uh, help with making hybrids to answer uh, publication questions. Um, we have a very high survival rate with the adults. I've had a pair of fish go to Taiwan and come back 21 days later, and uh, they were perfectly fine and healthy. So um, once they're in the bag, they are uh, in, in a safe condition until that bag is opened up. Uh, with the embryos, we can get very dense uh, packs. We typically put 100 embryos in a tissue culture flask. Um, we use a defined embryo media um, with the methylene blue to reduce uh, microorganisms. They are uh, more biosecure in that they are um, surface sanitized with chlorine. It's not a perfect technique, but it does reduce uh, many echidoparasites as well as ciliated protozoans. Um, and we can get very high densities uh, with dozens of strains in a box, uh, say going to China or somewhere where it's a little more difficult to ship. Um, and the embryos are more cost effective than shipping the adults, but they are much more sensitive to uh, temperature issues and delays as, as they're developing. And the most dense way of distributing the lines is through cryopreserved sperm. We can uh, ship hundreds of lines representing thousands of mutants uh, in multi-allelic lines uh, coming from the Sanger zebrafish mutation project. Um, we, this is the safest and most effective transfer of large collections between the repositories. 
the Sanger Zebrafish Mutation Project, they're up to 24,000 alleles, uh, about halfway through their project to uh, essentially mutate the entire genome. So when we're distributing the animals, it's uh, critical to label the animals appropriately. Here we have a, an order number, which is the distribution we're making. Uh, it's the line of uh, transparent zebrafish we have, and uh, the, the individual animals' uh, date of birth and the quantities. And here's a similar label to uh, some embryos that were also being shipped in that same order. And here are some of the, the fish ready and uh, willing to be packaged. So uh, it's critical to keep the water in the bag. Um, <laughs> that's easier said than done. Um, we use uh, three mil, not millimeters, but thousandths of inch uh, polyethylene watertight bags. Um, the inner bag, we make handmade square bottom bags which eliminate corners uh, which can trap the fish when uh, pressure and temperature changes in shipment. Uh, the outer bag, we just use a standard straight-bottomed bag. Uh, at the stock center, we use an aluminum tipper tie clip, which is uh, uh, an aluminum fastener similar to you, what you would find in the grocery store on, say, a chicken or a sausage casing. Um, it makes for uh, very tight bags that do not deform during shipping. Uh, getting the pleats in the top of the bag is critical. Um, if, you, if they're not even, if you have large overlaps, the fish can be uh, entrained and, uh, and die. This is uh, the basic wall-mounted clipper we use. Uh, it's manually operated, but there are pneumatic and uh, other types of clippers available. Uh, the most common way other than clippers is rubber bands. Um, I've tried to teach colleagues uh, how to rubber band bags for years, and <laughs> I'm one of the few people at, at my center that can actually rubber band a bag properly. Uh, again, getting the pleats across the top is critical to uh, maintain the shape and the, uh, eliminate the folds that can trap the fish. Time tape is not the proper way to seal a bag. Uh, we've gotten several shipments with uh, innovative yet uh, inappropriate ways of sealing the bags. Uh, often they leak and animals can be lost. Um, pressure is also important. Um, you need to maintain uh, equal water and gas pressure so that the bag doesn't deform trapping fish in the corners. Uh, we have seen some creative alternatives to bags over the years. Uh, there's a cubitainer, uh, collapsible polyethylene bladder. Uh, these are actually quite efficient and uh, anyone can screw the top on the lid uh, and, and keep the water in the box. Uh, tissue culture flasks are also uh, a useful way. Um, wouldn't pack very many fish in them. Um, and some of the more innovative techniques have involved uh, soda bottles. Um, more efficient than time tape, they don't leak, and uh, the, the fish actually make it alive. <laughs> Not recommended, but um, creative. Uh, so labeling the boxes, uh, uh, IATA, we've got the uh, live animal and up arrows. Uh, in addition to this, there are, uh, there's a, uh, an urge for people to put styrofoam boxes in freezers, so we often uh, recommend to not freeze the animals. Um, receiving personnel are used to getting dry eye shipments in these type of boxes, so uh, we, we like to recommend they keep them at room temperature. Uh, the box we use is a standard uh, insulated shipper. We use a, a corrugated outer box with a styrofoam inner liner uh, available through the uh, supply houses. Um, we have three sizes of boxes that we use and we can get anything from a flask of embryos up to 18 uh, lines of fish in, in one box. Um, we use heat packs to uh, maintain the, the temperature in the winter. Uh, during the summer months they typically aren't needed, um, especially if we have adults going. The uh, water helps uh, keep them warm. 
Uh, these heat packs are essentially a rapid rusting of uh, harmless ingredients that uh, consume oxygen. So it's important to uh, have the breathing stripes uh, available to uh, breathe oxygen. If you tape the box up too tightly, they will uh, extinguish themselves. So we use a uh, high-tech device such as a uh, disposable bamboo chopstick to puncture a, a small hole in the lid, which then the heat packs are taped to th that hole. This image is actually the reverse of what we do, but it's just showing the stripes. And in the winter, you want to completely surround the heat packs with tape so that cold air isn't uh, infiltrating the box. Uh, this is a package about to be uh, filled in with peanuts. There's embryos and a bag of adults there. Um, the embryos are generally placed next to the water uh, to help keep them moderated. Um, you don't want them to experience uh, large swings, whereas if they're off in the corner of the box, they, they can get a little colder. And uh, you want to isolate the animals from the heat pack. Um, a single layer of bubble wrap is usually sufficient. Um, we tape it to the lid of the box and also use packing peanuts and close up the box. So filling voids, there's uh, multiple techniques we use for that. Of course, packing peanuts and uh, not the biodegradable kind. Uh, if you do have any leakage, you will end up with glue. And um, the, that's something you want to avoid because they do collapse and then the animals can move around the package. Uh, bu bubble wrap is also useful. We'll often uh, cluster embryo flasks um, and wrap them to uh, keep them as a solid brick so they don't uh, crash against each other if the box is dropped. Um, for larger boxes, we'll just fill additional bags with oxygen to uh, take up void. Um, and then again in the winter, we'll use water-filled fish bags with uh, no gas in them. Um, and this uh, increases the thermal mass to moderate the temperature, and it works in both hot and cold conditions. Um, it usually uh, Usually the fish shipments do not exceed the volume weight, meaning the weight we're charged to ship that volume uh, is usually greater than what the, the fish actually weigh. So even though you're adding more weight to the box, it, it generally doesn't affect the, the price of the shipment. So a little bit on the chemistry that keeps the fish alive in these bags for so long. We've got our water, of course, and pH is critical. Uh, in this case, we actually want the pH to go down. Um, in lower pH, the ammonia uh, that the fish are producing through their gills is ionized. And uh, in addition to that, we add a chemical called Chloramex, which binds the ammonia uh, chemically before the pH is, is lower than uh, in the bag. It usually goes to about 6.5, uh, which is almost completely ionizing the ammonia. And the Chloramex helps uh, protect uh, while the uh, carbon dioxide is uh, building up in the bag. Uh, we generally start off with 50% uh, oxygen, 50% water. That can be adjusted uh, depending on the density of the pack. Uh, for the research fish, we package at m much uh, uh, lower density than uh, commercial fish farms would. Um, and again here, the carbon dioxide is lowering our pH. Typically, uh, even if you buffer the water, the, the, by the end of the trip, the pH is about 6.5. Um, and when we open the package, uh, the pH can rise as the carbon dioxide off-gasses. So typically, we open the bag and remove the fish from the shipping water immediately and place them in clean water of similar uh, conditions to their origin. Temperature is uh, critical. Uh, we want to keep things warm, but um, for every 10 degrees of Celsius, the fish's uh, metabolism uh, halves or doubles depending on the rate you're going, the direction you're going. Um, and in, because of this, Singapore is a much more dangerous location for us than, say, Iceland even in the winter. Um, Iceland in the winter, you, you might have some problems with some embryos here or there, but the adults will always make it, and, uh, and generally with thermal mass and heat packs, everything will make it. Uh, care and route, there's uh, no additional care required. Uh, the fish are uh, pretty much in the dark and asleep and uh, can, 
can go without any care other than handling. And uh, we uh, tell the carriers to store ambient and please do not place them in a freezer um, and get them there quickly. Um, export oversight. Uh, zebrafish are not um, controlled by the USDA. Um, uh, Fish and Wildlife does uh, control their export. Um, and the USDA can come into play if the recipient countries are requesting the health certificate. Um, you can see IREGs for all the various regulations. Um, and we typically work with the couriers to uh, develop the document packages and let them file with the agencies. Uh, Customs and Border Control is in there somewhere else. Uh, we also, once it's in the uh, courier's hands, we let them handle those aspects. So when things go wrong, there was this uh, unpronounceable volcano in Iceland that <laughs> seemed to eat all of Europe. So we had a large shipment uh, destined for Ireland, and uh, they were stranded in Frankfurt. And um, there are German animal welfare laws covering tropical fish. If they're not going to reach their destination before their demise, uh, they will invoke these rules and sell them to tropical fish wholesalers. So after multiple attempts to recover these animals, um, the German authorities said they were gone and they were not recoverable until I went to their website and sent a general inquiry asking how their uh, news agencies would like to handle a story about genetically modified animals being sold to children for their home aquariums. <laughs> Within days, the fish were in Ireland. And uh, sometimes you have to think out of the box. It took me a few days to get there, but um, after weeks of <laughs> going through this, I, I said, well, let's, let's go through the front door and see how it worked. And uh, the, the fish got to Ireland eventually. So, And uh, thank you for your time. And uh, 